All right, everybody, if uh, you'll make your seats, we're going to get started with our next presentation. I'm sure you guys have heard of a game called The Hobbit. And then maybe you've heard of Jersey Jack. I'm sure that... Uh, You know, Jack, Jack and I go way back. We've been Facebook friends now for a couple years. And uh, so, <laughs> anyway, thank you, Jack, for coming. I'll let you introduce your, uh, your co-host here. And just thank you for being here in Texas once again. And let's, let's see what you got to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. How's everybody doing? All right. This is, um, this is one of my favorite places to come anytime. Um, I was kind of uh, worried that I wasn't going to make this trip because my dad, can everybody see me? Uh, maybe. No, you're about this tall. You know, I'm a little short. I, I I'm a little short. You, you can see my big no nose, clothes. you know, probably see that. Hey. So, you know, um, a few days ago, my dad, who's 86, he wound up in the hospital in Orlando. My sister's down there, and my dad, um, he's 89, my dad, so. And uh, he wound up in the hospital, dehydrated and everything like that. So, you know, at 89, I, I think we always think, oh, we're going to have our parents forever. And he was in a few days, and I said, you know, I better get my behind down to Florida. And I went to see him, and uh, luckily that next day he came out of the hospital. So Friday morning, he had to do, uh, this is TMI, so he had to go to the bathroom, you know. So I was never so happy Friday morning to look and say, wow. Yeah, I was never so happy to see shit, okay? <laughs> so literally, my dad said to me, listen, you know, I'm okay, I'm doing great. You know, if I could connect my phone, I would have put a picture up there of him. Uh, he's doing great, and he says, why don't you go to Texas? Why don't you, I don't want you to miss the Texas Pinball Festival. So I told Ed Van Deveen and, and the guys, you know, that give away my room, give away my gift basket, I'm not coming to the show. Thanks for the gift basket. Man. Butch got the gift basket, so the probability of me sleeping on Butch's couch last night was real. So what actually happened was that Ed, you know, they were able to pull some strings, they got me a room. I'm on the penthouse, I got a beautiful view of the baseball field out back. And um, my dad's great, and I'm here with you guys, so I'm, I'm really happy. You know? You know, he's my, my, so my dad is, is 89, as I said, he's a World War II veteran. He was sent to Japan after they dropped the bomb. Here's a guy that he got colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, and he lost a uh, kidney because of cancer. And that generation, Butch has a dad like that too, that is unbelievable. They don't build those people like that anymore. You know, we fall down somewhere and we're gone. So. It's amazing. It's a blessing. I thank God. Um, so, Pinball, you know, thank everybody for coming to listen to us. Take time out of your day from playing what we love inside all those uh, pinball machines. Texas, this show is really great. It is. Everything is bigger in Texas, and I love it. Um, there are lines to play Wizard of Oz. Uh, a few of you and other people have accosted me and threatened me. Why is there only one Wizard of Oz? A whole bunch of people said, why is there one habit? You know, so I said, well, you know, uh, it's like 30, 40 grand for us to build a prototype game. So if you want to have a game next time that costs you nine or ten, eleven thousand dollars, you know, we, we only build five or six of them because those are traveling around the world. Um, Butch has a, a, a spiel here to do. I haven't really seen it, and I don't think he'll put you to sleep. And uh, we're going to take some questions. Anybody wondering any kind of anything, you know, we'll answer all your questions uh, in a political way. So if you ask me, you know, what's Pat Lawler's game, I'm going to tell you what Pat Lawler's game is. So if you ask that question. If you ask me how come I was bidding on a Defender pinball machine before up to six grand and I didn't get it, I'll answer that question too. Um, you know, what, whatever it is. If you want me to you know, give you some kind of advice on uh, whatever it is, I can do that too. So at this point, let me introduce Butch Peel, who is our, um, one of our electrical engineers, the guy that wrote that, that manual that is about, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, really, so that game manual obviously is in the game uh, on screen. It's on a disc, and we've sold them. Uh, you know, we, we've sold a lot of them. Uh, and actually, let me just say this, right? So right now at the factory, we're still building Wizard of Oz. 
uh, which is really cool to still see them coming. Every day we get orders, which is great. How many people have a Wizard of Oz? Uh, that's awesome, great. And um, there'll be some new software for it coming. Um, and I'll touch on this in a little bit. Uh, the software that's coming is called Pendemption. So it may not be applicable for a lot of people. And what it does, it collapses the rules of the game and it makes the game more commercially viable. So we've had a couple of games on location in New Jersey at I Play America. And the pinball machine there typically would make maybe $120 a week as a Wizard of Oz pinball machine. Other pinball machines there were making about $40 or $50 a week. And there are games in that location that make you know, hundreds of dollars a day. So again, pinball in a, in a real redemption arcade has a really difficult time competing with those games. And that's why you don't see pinball on location. So when we implemented Pindemption and we started testing this, and I showed it at the London show in January, and Martin was there, um, it was great feedback because it's time play, it's based on time, not balls, and it's also based on easily achievable objectives to win tickets manually from the game or electronically on your swipe card. Or if you don't want tickets and you're a street operator, you can put this pinball machine in a bar location and let's say you set it up for two minutes or three minutes. So a player like Keith Johnson is not going to come up to your game and sit there for 40 minutes playing the game. He's going to get thrown off the game. So I haven't tested it in street locations, but in an arcade environment, very competitive, multi-million dollar arcade, the game has gone from making about $120 a week to between three and $500 a week per game. So this turns it into a very viable piece of equipment that makes sense for me as a game operator to buy. So we also had to change certain things about the game because we found as we're watching people swipe their card, they don't know how to start the game. They don't know what the flippers do. They don't know what the ball shooter does. And you know, us pinball people, we live and breathe this, we know this. But I can tell all of you that I've been out in the real world, and most of the real world, I hate to tell you, they don't know what a pinball machine is. We go to shows like the amusement park show, and there are regular people there, not pinball people there. And they walk up to me, and they say things like, hey, I didn't even know they still make pinball machines. Well, this is great. When I hear that, I don't get discouraged. Because if somebody told me, Jack, go out and sell more Coca-Cola. Yeah, I could probably do that. But Coca-Cola had to invent a machine that mixes all kinds of flavors together for you to get Coca-Cola, because everybody doesn't want to drink soda. Well, if I told you, go out and sell more pinball, this is really easy, because so many people don't know what it is. And especially young people, when we get these games into places like family entertainment centers, and as I sold thousands of pinball machines, since 1999 through pinballsales.com, those games went to people's homes. And those kids that were 12 years old in 2000, and they grew up with pinball machines in their house, well now they're 27 years old, and 24, and 25, and 29, and 30. And guess what they're doing? They're going out into public locations that do not have pinball machines, and they're saying to people in those locations, how come you don't have a pinball machine here? So we basically are growing a new crop of people that love pinball. And it had to start in a grassroots way because operators, and I'm an operator, I'm a game operator, a revenue share operator. For, this is my 40th year in the industry. So I'm a technician. I'm an electronics technician or pinball mechanic since 1975. So I'm not a person that owns a pinball company that didn't do this stuff. I did it and I still do it. And I, and I understand what it is. I'm not a salesperson. Go, go out and sell this thing, you know? So I believe we can get pinball machines back on location. I believe if the return on investment, you know, people say to me, Jack, you know, your pinball machine is $8,000. If it was $5,000, I would buy it. Well, if it was $5,000, it would have $3,000 less fun in it and it would make $30 a week. So if you buy my $8,000 game, it's going to make you $150 a week. It's not what the game costs, it's what the game makes. Okay? That's the language that I talk to operators, and they listen to me because I'm an operator, and I've created other games that make money for them. So us getting pinball machines back on location will happen. As we produce more, right now Wizard of Oz 
is about a 30-day backlog to get orders. Every day we get orders. We get 10, 5, 12 container loads. And it's great because a year ago, I owed people 1,500 Wizard of Oz games. And basically, I wasn't going to get any money for those games. They were already paid for. Well, now I don't owe anybody Wizard of Oz games. We already ship more than 2,500 of them all over the world. So now we build Wizard of Oz, we get money. And operators get games. So I still haven't had a game in a box in my building that didn't have an owner. Imagine that. You know, and all my friends in big businesses, bigger than mine, say, Jack, what an amazing problem you have. You have people that want your product. They pay for your product before they get it, some of them, or they give you part of the money before you get it, and you have no accounts receivable, and you love what you do. So every day I thank God, because that's what enabled me to do this. What nut is going to start a pinball company basically in the middle of the greatest recession that we've known? Who's going to do that? And really, I couldn't do any of that alone. I had a great team with me. I had all of you that believed in me first, trusted me, sent us millions of dollars to make a game that nobody saw, nobody played, from a factory that didn't exist. There are many instances of divine intervention, how this company got where it got to. And I always go back to the acorn theory. You know, I say, how does an acorn become an oak tree, right? What is in that acorn that enabled it to become an oak tree? And I'm not going to get spiritual here. Woo! Okay. So, you know, I believe every element in the universe that had to come to the acorn made it an oak tree. And that's what our company is. Everything that had to come to the company, whether it was employees, customers, um, vendors, there have been a lot of bad times for the company. There were a lot of nights where I laid in bed. You know, I could never think of failure. I could never think of hundreds and hundreds of people, millions and millions of dollars, vendors that are owed money, and people saying, a few people saying, You'll never do it. It'll never happen. You'll never build games. They'll never work. They'll never this. Well, just keep your mouth shut. Keep walking forward. You don't get to the top of the mountain by leaping up there. You climb up, and you stop, and you regroup, and you climb up, and you go to base camp, and you regroup, and you go up there. And you climb to the top of the mountain step by step. And anybody in this room, anybody, you have the ability to do anything you want to do. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't do something. Because I was one of these kids that if somebody told me you can't do it, bullshit, I'm going to do it. Okay, now, all right, the entrepreneur in me said, I'm going to leap out the window, and when I leap out the window, I'm going to figure out how to fly. The logical part of me, the electronics technician in me says, that's not a good idea. You should plan something before you leap out the window because you're probably going to get cut and it's going to hurt and all of that kind of stuff. Listen, you got to have a lot of faith and you got to have a lot of belief in yourself and the team you put together and you just got to keep, keep on task and keep going. So, Hobbit, somebody said to me today, I didn't like Wizard of Oz, but Hobbit is great. You know, we sold 13 games online today. And I know there are people in the room that bought games from other distributors that we have. So the game's not a piece of crap. It's a great game. It's, it's got more stuff in it than Wizard of Oz. And Pat's game will be better than Hobbit and Wizard of Oz put together. And the game after Pat's will be better than that, because that's what we want. We want to make every game better, not take more stuff out of it or charge more money or make it worse. We want to put more fun in it and make it better and better. That's what I want to build things that haven't been built before. I don't want to build anything that's been built for before. If you want to build something that's built and built before, I have respect for that, but I'm not going to do that. The hard, the hard we can do. The impossible is what we want to do. Okay? So, again, here's Butch. That's enough for me, and we'll take some questions after. Thank you. I got one here. That's you. I ought to take that away from him, but I'm going to let him keep it. So, um, my wife, Joanne, Joanne just, my wife just texted me. Very important news. Uh, she's watching Miami Vice again. So I want you to know that on TV in New Jersey with 10,000 channels and a 75-inch screen, there is nothing to watch on TV. So you might as well play pinball.
Amen. Amen. Okay, as, uh, as Jack was saying a minute ago, my name is Butch Peel. Um, I'm a, consider myself one of the luckiest guys on the face of the planet because I got the chance to work at Jersey Jack Pinball. And I, I thank this nut over here every day for, for giving me that opportunity. I, I, I know there's a lot of guys that would kill to be in my place. Um, I, I don't know what exactly I told him when, uh, and all the times we talked and emailed and all to, to get him to hire me, but, uh, and he won't tell me what I told him, so. I'm just, yeah, there to go. But I, I love pinball. Uh, that's probably what I could probably attribute it to most of all, is I just have a, an unmatched passion for it, everything about pinball. I've been telling people all around while I'm working on the game out there, you know, I love doing this stuff. But God, I don't. I hate working on the refrigerator or the dryer or my car or anything. I just can't stand it. But uh, you know, get, show me a pinball machine that's not working, and I'm just like drawn like a moth to the flame. Uh, I gotta help. Gotta do something with that. Um, pinball is is just it's coming back. I, I mean, I look at this this group around. We're such a diverse group. You you see guys walking around with tattoos and piercings and these weird haircuts, you know, like Matt Reister, and uh, you know we we get people, young kids, women, children, you know, high school, college, uh, old men, old women. There there's all kinds of people out there, and I, that just tells me that you know we have such a diverse group to draw from. There's so many people that enjoy this game that, you know, it, it's just really cool to be part of bringing it back. And, and I can't, again, thank Jack is, uh, enough about it. True story here. You know, it's, it's always really cool to, to talk about pinball. I, I wear my... By the way, you only have an hour. Yeah, and you took half of it, so okay. <laughs> no, I, took, I took 20 minutes. Yeah, and that, that was, he almost handed it over in 10. Minutes. <laughs> I, I understand, but what I got to talk about, true story here. I'm, I'm, I'm delivering, I'm going to pick up a couple of pinball machines, and I'm, I'm driving with my sister. My dad and I, my sister, make a trip out of it. So we dropped my dad off at, in uh, Texas, and we're going on up to Jackson, Mississippi to pick up a couple of pinball machines. And I am driving all day along with my sister we dropped my dad off at his friend's house and we're almost to the hotel I mean we've got on the GPS we're like less than a tenth of a mile and I see it there's a Holiday Inn Express that we're staying at just then I pass by a police officer on the side of the road and I'm coming up on this other car that's going just unusually slow in the right lane for whatever reason we've got New Mexico plates I live in the state of New Mexico and I pull in and I start slowing down but I guess he decided I was following a little too closely that car he throws his lights on and pulls me over, I mean, right at the exit to my hotel. And he comes walking up there, and I'm thinking, oh, boy, I know how this is going to go. You all ain't from around here, are you? You in a heap of trouble now, boy. And so I'm, I'm sitting there waiting for the guy to come up, and you know how you get with a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew he was doing something back there. I get it, I get it even with him anyway. So this police officer walks up there and all you see are belt buckle and gun and you, you hear him say, you know why I pulled you over? And you tell him, no sir. And he, he tells me that I'm following too close. Says, what, what are y'all doing here in the, in the state of Mississippi? And I said, we're coming here to pick up a couple of pinball machines. I'm, I'm a truthful guy. Ne next thing you know, I look over and that guy's face is right here and he's like, oh, <laughs> he says, you know where I might be able to get a back glass for a tropic aisle? <laughs> so pinball is way cool. can get you out of getting tickets and all that. He asked me, where are you headed? I said, right there. Actually, we're going to, you know, that green light that's shining. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, pinball's great. I mean, I walked in yesterday, I'm going to my hotel room, and I look up and there's four guys struggling with one of those uh, car, um, carts that they move uh, uh, baggage around with. And they're trying to get a high-speed pinball machine for them into, a, into the elevator. And I'm like, I love it. These are my people. I'm home. I'm home. It's Hey, you guys laugh, but how many, raise your hand, you ever had to put your pinball machine that you bought in your hotel room? Every, we've done it, we've done it, admit it. Yeah, not, not the 1030. So, I got a, I, we got a call from Ed, you know, he's asking us if we could come to the show and, and uh, if we could, if we were interested in doing a spot, he had a 7 o'clock spot for us and, and Jack kind of says, well, I don't really like to talk and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'll, I'll talk to people by the pinball machine. I say, "Hey, Jack, I didn't say that. 
Yeah, I'll, say, I'll throw something together, you know, if you want me to. I, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the Hobbit changes, you know. I think people will be interested to see how the Hobbit's changed since Expo last year, since it was, you know, it was kind of a big deal when we, we announced we were going to delay and change things a bit. And uh, so he said, yeah, yeah, go ahead and put something together. So Ed was happy to put us in, and, you know, it, it all ended well. And then Ed texts me back and says, you know, I need a really super, super duper, you know, title for your, your uh, seminar. And, it, and he says, how about, uh, you know, Hobbit, uh, this wonderful, you know, ecstatic journey with Butch Peel. And I said, with Butch Peel, no one's going to show that. <laughs> I said, just put Jersey Jack Pinball, take the name off there to begin with. So I, gave, I, I told him, how about an unexpected, unexpected journey? Because what we, we started out down this road, and we thought we had pretty much reached the end of the road when we got to Expo last year. And we brought us a game out there. We um, we had one one good working prototype like we had here, one of those expensive things. What you looking at? Keep talking. Yeah, don't don't start don't start don't mess me up now. You no touchy touchy. Yeah, yeah. I've seen you with a pinball machine. <laughs> So, so anyway, I, I told them, you know, yeah, we, we, we can put something together. We, we'll, uh, we had our game ready to go. Um, it's an unexpected, unexpected journey because at that show we got a little, what you might say, uh, critical feedback. We got our ass kicked. Yeah. <laughs> lukewarm was the way I like to pronounce, you know, say what we, what we received there. A little lukewarm welcome, and we didn't get a lot, of, a lot of interest in the game. So we thought, you know, there's some things we can do to make this a lot better. But it's an unexpected, unexpected journey because we were there, we, and then we ended up just taking a, a kind of a U-turn and stepping back a little bit, going down to another base camp on the mountain and starting back up in another direction. So, for instance, like our, our, our play field wiring here, we all look at the Wizard of Oz and we said, you know, that's a lot of wiring stuff. And people complain, oh, this, this stuff is just crazy. I can't follow these wires around no matter what I do. So one of the things we concerted goal we're going to do, we're going to make the Hobbit wiring a lot simpler. So one thing, we have issues with the lights, so we redesigned the light system and we started thinking of ways to make the, the cables better and, and, and make it where we used one single cable that you could order one and it would replace any of the light cables and different boards that were, could be placed in the same you know, all around the play field so that things could be as flexible as possible and try and make it as easy to produce as possible. Yeah, lessons learned from the first time around, right? So then we we do the Hobbit. and Wow, that's a lot less wire. Yeah, th this, ladies and gentlemen, is what's commonly referred to as epic failure. So, I mean... So, so just that. think about this one second, right? Yeah, I get it. You know, think about this one second, and not to interrupt Butch, so... The, Anybody that says that there's less stuff on The Hobbit than Wizard of Oz only needs to look under the play field. We can't put another thing under here. And remember this, Butch, point out, you had gigantic light boards on The Wizard of Oz. They're gone. They're gone. There's all little boards that we're using, you know, in, in this game and future games. So Eric, Eric designed all those, and that's future technology. One big board. One big board. That's we One call little that board. Argument. It's yeah. not even the fish board. Yeah, that, that could, that's like a little fish yeah, egg board. The, the, the big fish could eat that board. Yeah, that's right. right. So, so yeah, the, these sorts of things are unexpected. When you get to this point and you look at that and you think, oh my God, boy, what a what a progress the game I will made. look better than that. That's you know. <laughs> That was the first crack, but yeah, the guys at the factory sent me this saying, uh, yeah, you guys really reduced that wiring way down right there. Appreciate the wiring it. guy sent me a big basket for Christmas. <laughs> They're like, don't help us so much next time around. How about that? So we go all the way back to when the, the Hobbit first came out. I was very fortunate in the fact, you know, Joe Balser started working on the game when he was still with our company. He, he designed and drew this all up exclusively on his uh, computer. And all the guys up there in Chicago were trying to get a sneak peek over his shoulder. He wouldn't show them anything. And I came up there in uh, May of, of 13, as the, the date shows there, and we were going to come up for a big Hobbit meeting. That was, we were going to start talking about the Hobbit design. And he had the, the drawing on his computer, and I just walked in and started looking over his shoulder and talking to him. And, and he actually you know, went through the play field with me for the first time outside of you know, his own brain. So. I asked him when we were done with that meeting and at the end of that if he would uh, print me out a, a paper like this. And Jack here, you know, he's, he's starting to get this also and he's releasing this portion of the play field and this little portion over here. And I'm thinking, boy, this is, this is really hard to keep quiet, but, you know, I'm going to roll this up and I'm going to stick it out in my shop and I'll pull it out at some later date. And this, this happens to be that date. So anyway, this is our, our original concept play field. 
you see some differences from what we ended up with, especially with these wire ramp things that come down here. These now dump onto the ramps. But for the most part, you see what you're seeing out on the... Bag end is different. Yeah, bag end is different, but I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Don't, don't, don't get to the funny part yet. So, but for the most part, you see what we've got out there. One, one thing that we had in, on, the, on the Whitewood that was kind of interesting is one of these disappearing posts, like the old, the old space shuttle or something like that. So that was something that Joe pulled out, wanted to put into a game. But, so it's not too hard to go from that to your, to your very first Whitewood, which is what um, we started showing people shooting at some of the, the, the shows last year. So the Whitewood has pretty much what you saw in the, in the drawings up there. Smog was a big question mark at that time. We knew what we wanted him to do, and of course that had to morph over time. Um, we knew we were going to put pop bumpers with some uh, sculptures. Some, some guys found some goofy trees. I don't know where they got those. But you know, we knew this, this one was going to be flat because it was under a ramp, but these two needed to have something on them. So just to get a feel and what it was going to look like and, and what the clearances were going to be, they put that on. From there, you take, you, you send the, the drawings. All this time that we're designing games, the, you, you've got that drawing that I, I showed you that, that was done in AutoCAD. You get Joe Walser drawing out what he's going to put on the game. Well, you start to get uh, layouts for your inserts. You start to find out where you're going to, where you're, where you're going to drill holes, where you're going to, I'm going to shoot you a, a burn a hole right through your ear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where, where, where things are going to be located. So you got holes. You got, if you look at our play fields, there, there's two ways to do play fields. You can, you can take a play field like this and you can leave as much bare wood as, as possible and only paint and cover the areas that uh, are actually going to show when the game is actually played. Or you can just paint the whole thing up, you know, and then that's what some of the other manufacturers have done. They've just painted everything. But I think this is really cool to, to put what we call die lines on here and show where the, the ball will travel only in places where there's paint. And it's, it leaves this as a, as a work of art and something like on a, a that shows the, the grain of the wood through. And I think that's kind of old school, and I think it's a really cool thing to do, and we, we still do that. But those die lines are basically the boundaries for a guy like JP that does her, the artwork to work within. And those are going to change if you change other things. I'm going to get into that a little bit here. One of the other cool things about, you know, when you, when some people don't realize this, I, I was talking to a girl about doing touch-ups today and she was talking about how some colors just don't cover well when you're trying to cover a brown or black with like a yellow color. How do you guys get to yellow color, you know, look so nice? Well, you start out with a white layer, and this is a white layer for The Hobbit. So you're going you're gonna to paint everything white to begin with, anywhere you're going to put graphics or artwork, and then you're going to come and you're going to put your graphics and your colors on top of that. So the subtlest of whites or off-whites can go right on top of a white or to your darkest of blacks, and, and they will all have good saturation and look well. So just a kind of a fun fact. Now, through the magic of dig digital uh, processing and all, a guy like J.P. Duin in, uh, that does all of our uh, um, video work, he's now doing the play field for The Hobbit, right? So he wants to be able to see what the finished picture is going to look like. So he takes that Whitewood drawing there, he takes the digital artwork, and he lays it on top of there. And he can further, he can go in and, and set our uh, plastics on top of that and show you know, things like the, the, the LCD was originally designed to go right there instead of up here where it ended later. But he can kind of get a feel for how things are going to look in, in total. And then he, he starts uh, in with his tuning of, the, of the, the artwork. If you look back at the previous, you, you see a lot of black lines or, or even, uh, whoops, let me go back a couple here. I know, I got five minutes or whatever. These are, are uh, some of the inserts that had, he puts in a clear, a clear acrylic looking something or other to make it look like those are the inserts when he knows just where they're gonna be. So, you know, in this early, early drawing, he just barely was putting in some of the inserts. So he, he, he's got a lot of artwork to add as he, as he goes in here. So you start to see now he starts putting some of the characters in here. He starts uh, filling in areas up here where they're going to be going down the, the river in their boats and, and uh, the gold and such and Smaug's uh, mountain, the, all the characters' faces. Uh, we know what kind of uh, uh, items we're going to tie in with these uh, rollovers here. We've decided early on that that rollover was going to kick one of these pop-ups up and that rollover was going to kick one of these pop-ups up. So you start trying to match that so you can show that when this one goes through here, the orc, the artwork kind of matches up to that. 
Um, when he goes from version four to version six, you start to see, you, yeah, he knew these were arrows. Well, now everything's much more ornate. He starts adding a lot of detail and a lot of stylizing to it. Um, you still see, you know, the same same shape here, but he's he's really working on this part of the play field up in the, between four and six. Between six, this is again repeating six, going to six to eleven. You see a lot more busy stuff in here. We t he wanted to put more artwork in there. We started telling him, you know, put some things like the vignettes, and, you know, little things in between that that that'll, little subtle light artwork in the background. And so he started adding things like that. He's very receptive. You know, it's his first play field, so he's very receptive to suggestions from us on the team. So that was kind of cool to be part of that too. So when he, go, he went from version 11 to version 16, now he, he can do version, version 16, did you hear that? Yeah. Like the, the word I hate least is the word change or revision. Because <laughs> all that means to me is time and money. Two things that I can't get back. But, but it means to us improvement. And so yeah, right. that's how we sell him on. But it, keep telling me that. <laughs> so now he can put the, he, he's getting a, a artwork for his, uh, his plastics. He can put that on top of here. And now he can really start to see what the play field in total is going to look like. Some of the plastics are to be determined because we don't know exactly what smell going to look like, clearances, things like that yet. And there's a little question about whether we're going to put something on that pop bumper. Those sorts of things are still to be determined. I saw a lot of stuff online of people talking about, well, why did you put on there Keeley the dwarf? Everybody knows he's a dwarf. Because, and why, why does it look like that? Well, we are licensed assets. Part of that, we get files and files and files of things like how they want the word the Hobbit to look, how if you were to say the Shire, what it should look like. We, we tried that on Wizard of Oz and some of the early Wizard of Oz artwork packages. Um, I know Greg Frears went in there and tried to stylize the, like the, the, the scarecrow when he wrote the word scarecrow and put it in like straw and things and make fancy fonts. The people rejected. Who yeah, people with the the license these things want you to instantly look at it and be able to recognize that as their name, their trademark. Not trying, you know, weird you, weird letters and things that that make people say, what does that even say? So all of these very huge blocks fonts, the Toto and all that, all that had to be changed so that it would match what they wanted. Well, these guys at Warner Brothers this time, with the new one, they gave us so many assets on how they wanted um, text and thing in there. So you just take and you drop that in, and you know that that's going to be accepted when you send it in to be, to be reviewed. You, you've, you've eliminated a, one of those back and forth steps where they say, that's not our font, that's not what we want you writing on there. You know, you, they don't want you writing Keeley the little guy or something like that. They want the dwarf, and that's, and so you put it on there. And that's just to speed things up. So now when we go back to, to version 11 of this, and we go from 11 to 16, you start to see more subtle changes. It, 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 you have to look kind of twice, several times, to see that some of these things have moved around and, and all that. Some of that's because JP's an artist. They, they like to do things like that. Some of it is, you know, these things have to be tweaked because there's been a rejection on this, this little part over here. And you might send it to one guy who likes it one week and you send the whole thing to the next guy the next time and it's another guy and he says he doesn't like what the other guy did like. You really get into some, some crazy stuff. But some of the things change a little because an artist looks at something and they can never kind of leave it alone. So. So here's the team as we're putting our, our, our game together there for, for sending out to Expo. And we, we were sweating this out, right? Yeah. And I remember the, you know, we got the smog. I was working on that thing for all afternoon trying to get him to spin around without binding up. And Jack looks at that when he says, how do you choose to die? And he says, well, that doesn't suck too bad. And so <laughs> we all felt really good about that. Well, when we went to the show, people, one of the main things people complained about was the artwork. And they said, you know, it was kind of drab. Some of the people in our own company were looking at it and saying, you know, this pinball is supposed to be bright. It's supposed to be dynamic. Well, not to interrupt you, but here's the other problem that happened with this license. Because this was spread out so long and the assets of the movie were not made available to us, we didn't know what Smaug looked like. It's kind of funny to say that now. But we weren't given that, because Peter Jackson has a multi-billion dollar, he has a multi-billion dollar license here, and we're nobody. Um, yeah, we're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars, but he's making millions and billions, okay? So you, you don't know what Smaug looks like. Once we found out what Smaug looked like, and then we looked at the Smaug that was on this game, and it kind of looked like a flying rat to us, 
I said, well, you know, not using the new assets that we received would kind of be like not having the Wicked Witch of the West in the Wizard of Oz game, because Smaug is obviously the villain in the game. So we had to rethink, we had this collision of assets at the same time the show happened, and there was this whole immediate, everybody loved the game, and then afterwards there was this, uh, hey, you know, maybe this could be this, and this could be that, and this could be the other. And realizing that the customers built the company, I said, we have to listen to the customers. We have three weeks till another show happens, amusement park show, you guys have to redesign the game in three weeks. Yeah, yeah so exactly, that's exactly what happened. But you know, we all, I had someone ask me, oh well, gosh, did everybody just join in and we just redesign it? No, there, there were some ideas, there were some things that, you know, we had decided to leave off the game for whatever reason that, that you know, Part of the team says, yeah, I really love that part of the team. Eh, kind of meh, not so much. Well, then they, they, they get into, you know, well, the, I, w I really would like to, to have this now. And okay, we'll give it a shot. So the things like the LCD come back. And, and we, lo we looked at it. I, I looked at it the first time I played it. And I'm like, how in the heck do you ever get into the pop bumpers in this game? You'd have to shoot the ball around the, the loop and be dropped in by way of a of a magnet up here. You can't shoot a ball up into this way and into that way. You'd just be hoping for loop shots. But So, you know, some, there were some glaring kind of errors and glaring things that we thought we could add to, to improve the game. But like like Jack was saying, the, the Smaug thing, we would get assets early on. Anything that had Smaug in it before he was seen on the screen had a watermark across it with a serial number that tied you to the to the person that had that picture of Smaug. So if that one got out, that serial <laughs> number got back to you and it was your you know what you know you were the one going to be charged with going to jail and all that so let's just kind of look well, JP when given a little bit of uh, you know this was a beautiful play field it, it, it was pretty I liked it I, I I didn't see anything wrong with it but when you tell him hey make it a little bit brighter and let's see let's see what you can do then he does things like this you know that's a little different add some color to it the characters down by the entrance to the ramp. Make them a little bigger. Make them a little more in the forefront. You know, put colorful borders around things. Lighten stuff up. You see what happens. Then we also added this entrance into the pop bumper. What does that do? It changes all his die lines. So now all of his artwork has to be redone and, and worked around. Plastic set has to be redone. Everything's going to be affected by that. Uh, 14 different playfield drawings I had done for the manual already had to be redone. Rip so, that out. Yep. A little further down the playfield. Very dark looking. It's a dark movie. That's what we all figured. But, you know, you could add a lot more color to it. It's a little different. Put some more borders on things. Brighten it up. Get rid of the flying rat. Now he's huge, right? And, but yeah, we had that had that image a long time ago, but it had a serial number across the front and do not use until after this date. What can you do when you've got to have a game out by Expo? A little further all the way down to the bottom of the play field. Again, pretty like it was, but had some color to it. It's a little different. Brighten things up. Move some of the labels around to where they're on top of inserts. So don't be afraid to put things on top of inserts. It's a happy little tree. Okay, so now then we can take that and we can take uh, JP's white wood and then put it all in the white wood, put the plastics on, put the uh, new new uh, apron on, and we can send this to Jack and say, uh, what do you think of that? And let him think for a second and say, I didn't have to think for a second. I'll I loved that it. One. I yeah. loved it. I, I think that one will work. So plastics, those are all going to have to change. Shapes and things of certain ones are going to change. But again, same direction. Make them a little more colorful. Brighten them up. So you go from that. Look at the slings. The colors go to green. And the, the ones that go up the side with the elves and the men, one on opposite sides of the play field. Decals, all these things had to be changed. You know, he's talking three weeks, like you say. Some of this stuff, the, the decals and things, you can print some new ones out and get them out. Well, you had to get them approved also yep, before exactly. you could show them in public. When you have a license to do a game and you actually have the license and you sign it and you paid money, you have responsibility to do certain things and you can't show things in public unless they're approved. And so as, as stylistic and cool as these uh, elf and dwarf and man targets were, they were hard to read. 
so maybe we'll make them where it's a lot easier to read the letters. You know, the, the spinners, that's kind of cool, him running down the road, but it's kind of dark again. Let's make them brighter and colorful. Even the covers for the, for the, uh, the pop-up mechs, make them more colorful. Faster, faster. Faster, faster. LCD interface, everybody knows what the Wizard of Oz looks like. We have this uh, general shape here. We could have done the same thing, but that w who wants to do that? That'd be boring. Let's do something different. So you start in and you think, well, here's some designs in, in Adobe Illustrator that JP puts together. Maybe a big circle with squares around the edge. Maybe a big square with circles around the edge. And then you put like all the dwarf symbols and you got places for credits and ball and play and scores. But this is the one he finally settled in on. And that one shows all the dwarfs at the top. And some, he's got some notes here about things he wants to put in all these areas. So let's take that and let's put it, put it in a little more detail now. And let's see what it looks like when we start putting videos playing in the corners and we see what the center looks like and the player score and all that. Now let's stylize it a little bit. Put some you know, carved rock and things like that and make, add some more color to it, make it brighter. Let's see what it looks like. You know, start putting some of those modes that we mentioned before in there. And then you get to this one that's got even more, you know, the little bit of labels and directions and things, you know, tells you what to do. And then you get to this here and now you, you can take it and you can start playing some video in those and see what it really looks like and how it comes to life. This has no sound, but I, I, it still looks cool. Nobody knows how to launch the ball, so yeah, you actually have, have a screen to tell somebody how to launch the ball. I saw a guy on a Star Trek The Next Generation this, this afternoon. He just kept hitting the start button. Start one game, start two games, start three games, start four games. And the, the nobody gun knows, that shoot the gun. Nobody knows gun. that four people could play a pinball machine. You have yeah, to teach well, them that He found too. out. He found out. But then he walked away with two, two balls into it. But I mean, you literally, uh, I walk into a game. Who doesn't around here that walks into anywhere where there's games on location, you see a blinking start button. What does that mean? Free uh, credits, yes! Okay, so now here's what our cabinets look like. Left side, we've had a lim limited edition that has this seaside bronze armor. It has this artwork package. The Smaug edition, which has like a golden colored um, package along with this artwork. And then the same as a standard, the limited Are those games three armor. different sizes? No, they're on a stairway, though, so, oh. so you go up, yeah. They're up the mountain, I guess. Yeah, that's right, up the mountain. Okay. And then there's the right side. Hmm. And here's my shameless uh, plug time. I got a buddy that's opening a bar in El Paso, and he's trying to bring pinball back. He's got 16 machines. You're ever in the El Paso area. Check him out at Rubik's. This message has been brought to you by... <laughs> and that's all we got, so... Good. That's good, Butch. Very nice. So, uh, questions? We have a few minutes. He has, um, anybody have any questions or anything like that? I'm sure nobody has any questions. Uh, Jesus, I'm sorry. Johnny Norman, yes. Yes. Here, Johnny. There's a, there's a microphone for you. When you had the prototype up at uh, Chicago Pinball Expo, will you tell the story what you did when the ball kept on getting hung up and you had to take the glass off? It was toward the end of the day and you were very tired and what you did and what you said afterwards. What, what was that? He said, you kicked the fire out of the leg and walked away and said, this ain't a stern. No, I didn't <laughs> say that. Ball loose. No, I don't think yeah. I said that. You're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Next. I, I, have, a, I have a question. On the yeah. Wizard of Oz right now, you have it where the high game is set at a certain number. Are we going to be able to reset that on the Hobbit to, uh, so we can be, have it as competition with kids? Be able to reset um, the high, high score? Maybe. Email Keith and ask him. That's a good question. Well, I, it, it's you just know. an important factor for, for satisfaction. For well, I'll tell you something. In the Pendemption software, um, you can have options for scoring. Um, I don't know that you can change the amount of digits on the score or the high score. But uh, this has been something we've talked about. So it may be an option that you'd be able to do. It's, it's probably a good idea. I yes. was asked a question about that some time back and uh, about somebody wanted to set their high scores all to zero. 
so that any score would be the high score because he was having right. kids over. Right. There he is. That's the guy right there. Right. And I brought that to Ted, and, and he brought up a, a bunch of different considerations that, that that would throw in. I'll just say this. Every other machine out on the floor can do that. Yep. Except for a Jersey Jack pinball, so just saying, Jack. It's okay. We don't want we don't want to be the same as everybody that, else. That's a good way for me to word it to Ted too. Yeah, I think so. Uh, what I what I you know it's not a bad thing. Um, you know we take obviously we've we've responded to our customers and take suggestions. So listen, if you if you want to do something like that, you know maybe we can accommodate that. Yeah, actually, it's my son back there. All right. That okay. you need to go talk to, Jack. Okay. That's good. what I was getting to. He there wanted his go. kids to all play right. the game and to have a have an all night long who could beat who score and who we got it sounds next. Sounds fun. Back there. Yeah, this is this is Jim. I live here locally in the area, and this is our first pinball tournament that my son and I have ever been to. Nice. Last year, my son and I decided to build a game room, and we decided what we wanted to put in it. And I said, "How about a pinball machine?" So I went on the internet and did some research on pinball machines, and I eventually came to your website and found it. Found a local distributor here, and I, I, I knew I wanted the Emerald City Limited Edition. That was the game I wanted. They had the game, we bought it, we built a wonderful game room. I just want to say thanks for that. You've done a remarkable job. I do have one question. I'd like to get the reverse flippers on that game to be random. We can't get far enough advanced into the game to get the reverse flippers back. Uh, well, I don't know. That's another, that's another uh, Keith thing. I don't know. That's you know, an interesting question. You can make it a software revision, you know, yeah. or something. Uh, well, update or whatever that word is you don't it's, like. It's, I don't know if it's the deepest rule set ever made. I really don't know. but. You know, don't be surprised. I said there's other software revisions. You know, and, and by the same token, like the the other gentleman, you know, we we can't set any other. Everybody's but the Wizard of Oz can do this. Show me another game that has so many options to change that you can modify and dial your game yeah. in every, and every set coil, the rules everything. up the way you like to play it and have your game be your personal game. I mean, there's sure. nothing like it. That gentleman there in the yellow. They're gonna bring you a microphone. Hang on one second. The Wizard of Oz and The Hobbit are both both have Wi-Fi capabilities. Is that correct? It's a wide-body game. Okay. So, well, what's your vision of the Wi-Fi? What what are you planning on doing with it? Is it going to be virtual tournaments, virtual? He's talking oh, Wi-Fi, not wide-body. Wi yeah. Sorry, my hearing went out for a moment there. Um, you know, we we built we built something that could really go very far. And it took a long time to really build it. So uh, you'll, you'll see in uh, game number three, um, you'll see those other things happen. And so game number three, you'll do things that no pinball machine has done before. It sounds like, you know, like, woo. Yeah, it, it, pro prob probably, because, you know, everything that's in The Wizard of Oz and in The Hobbit will be in game number three, too. So. Um, you would be able to do it on the platform. I know, I don't want to be too vague. Uh, if I could be more vague, I would, so, but thank you, yeah. Yes, yes. Hey, big fan, thank you for everything you guys are doing. You brought the topic up, my question was gonna be, give us a little more of a hint on game three. Hmm. So, um, you know, when I was here last year, I kind of talked about Pat for a couple of minutes, how he was, uh, as an operator, I was so thrilled to buy his games, also Steve Ritchie's games, because those were the games that really made money on location. And then when Pat wanted to come out of his uh, self-imposed retirement in pinball, and he wanted to come work for our company, how amazing that was. So, you know, part of, um, part of our plan for the company is kind of to get away from the multi-year uh, pre-order model. And not because of anything going on in the marketplace, because uh, you know I just I just don't want to live through that all the time. You know the company grows up. So Pat's game, what's happened to it, is it's continued to be developed and evolved, and closer and closer to being finished. So this year we'll show Pat's game complete. And the reason I need to show it complete is because if I told you the name of the game right now or the theme of the game right now, I'd need about six hours in this room to explain to you what his game is, all right? 
it's, it's Pat Lawler. But it's Pat Lawler, when he came into the company, you know, he wanted to know what his boundaries were, what his budget is, what his timeline is, what my expectation was. I said this before, I said, listen, I am not hiring Michelangelo to tell him how to paint the Sistine Chapel. Just make an awesome, unbelievable game. Just make it fun. Do all the things you do as Pat Lawler. You're free to do it. And a few months ago, there was actually something on the game that he was going to pull out of the game because he kind of thought he crossed the line. Maybe it was a budget or a timeline thing. And I heard about it. You know, these guys are in Illinois. I'm in New Jersey a lot of the time. And they make decisions sometimes without me, believe it or not. And I caught wind of this, and I called him up, and I said, what are you doing? And he told me what he's doing. And I says, no, you're not doing that. You're, you're going to leave that in the game. So I know that he's not used to hearing that kind of stuff. So all I can really tell you about his game is that uh, Jack's played it, and he's liked it, first of all. Um, it's not done right now. Ted is working you know, on software for it. Um, John Yowsey is doing the artwork. Dave Deal is doing the sound. Uh, John Crutch uh, did a toy for it. Um, other people on the team, uh, Rob and other people that are in, on the team, it, it's a great team that's working on the game and I'm really, really um, excited about it. And every game that we do, we want to make better and better and add more and more and, and, and try to keep it affordable and, and get it on location and make it make money. So it's just, it's just really exciting. And you know, we're getting into game number four also. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all good. We're in a really good place. I'll right be now. writing the manual and... Uh, <laughs> Who else? The I, reason I, it takes six hours for him to tell you about the game because yeah, it's I Jersey can't. Jack talking about Pat Lawler. That would yeah. take forever. Yeah, it is an original theme. It's not a movie. You know, all the things we talked about with licensed uh, product, you have different problems when you don't have a license. We have to create all the animation. We have to create everything. But all the intellectual property is ours. There's nobody telling us what to do, what font to use, this and that. It's ours. So this is a different challenge. And so. I'll tell you one thing, Pat, when we first start talking about his game, Pat wants to have fun. That's what's cool about yeah. it. We yeah. will design all this stuff and right. come up with all this it, stuff it won't be, fun it won't, in mind. It won't be a dark game, put it that way. It won't be uh, blood and guts. It'll be a fun game. Do you know if any of the stars from The Hobbit have bought your pinball machine? I don't know that, but I do know through the studio um, that Warner Brothers, people at Warner Brothers have purchased games, so I don't know where they're going. I, you know, we have distributors and people all over the world, and we hear about celebrities that buy games, and I, I, I can't even tell the story, but a, a really major celebrity bought um, a 75th anniversary game, and she was given it by her husband for Christmas. And she got into pinball in California, and the distributor was giving her a manual. She researched online, this famous celebrity, that there was a printed manual, and she wanted it, and she told the distributor to order it for her. So the distributor said, no, no, you're not going to pay for it. I'm going to give it to you as a gift. When he said that to her, crazy as this sounds, she asked for me to sign it for her. And my daughter, Jen, came to me and said, you're not going to believe this, but so-and-so asked for your autograph. <laughs> and my daughter looked at me like, like really? And you know, I was like, wow, you know, pinball just transcends so many cool things. It really is amazing. Yeah. Well, uh, that that would be a good segue, Jack. Good. Maybe maybe somebody would like your autograph. No. Or to talk. Not really. On a check, maybe. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna sing "Timey Kangaroo Down." My friend John is here from Brisbane. He flew all the way from Brisbane. Who came the furthest to be here? Who came the farthest? He did. Australia? Okay, go ahead. Take it away. Yeah, if uh, Jack is going to stick around for just a couple more minutes, maybe some people would like to ask you a few more questions. We'll go ahead and start getting ready for the next good. seminar. Good. Everybody give a big round. Thank you to Jersey Jack. And make sure and play The Hobbit while you're here.